Here we are in the course. This is Alexander Hamilton, um, Le Troisième de Novembre. Me, oh wait, is it? Oh, oh sorry. Yeah, so we don't say the, like, the first Thank you for correcting me. Je ne suis pas parfait. Je sais, mais je n'arrive pas d'être parfait. Is that right? Yeah. Did I say that right? I, I try, but I do not always achieve perfection. All right, now you know. Um, uh, so, um, uh, I just want to, uh, what I just passed out was, no. Well, first of all, um, we'll, we'll try to cover the main points of, of what I've been calling Act 3 of Hamilton's life. And then on Friday, we'll probably finish this up and turn to Act 4, which I term as the Adams administration. And I dated it first from 795, 1795, when he leaves the Washington administration. Uh, and then, by the way, the, his last major act is to really help Washington compose the farewell address, which I've asked you to write an assignment on for tomorrow night. Uh, and, um, and then, so on Friday, we'll turn to what I call Act 4, which is the Adams administration, Federalist Party leader, uh, uh, public decline in some ways. And, and we'll read an interesting and poignant um, uh, passage from the Chernobyl book. If you have your Chernobyl book, by the way, we'll do some reading from that today. And then personal tragedy, that is to say Philip's death in the duel, and then his own duel and death. And that will probably take us through Monday. After Monday, we are going to turn back to Hamilton, and we'll start working through uh, uh, Miranda's own autobiography of the play. And we'll probably be going back and forth between chapters of that book and scenes of the play that we've already seen just to reinforce it. So that will probably take us through most of this uh, month. I don't anticipate actually being able to act out the play The Patriots that I'd wanted to, which is kind of an interesting take on Jefferson and, um, and, and Hamilton. But we will finish the, the last, the last uh, work that we'll read in the play, in the book, in the course. <laughs> now that'll wake up whoever. I think I did. Yes, you might. Um, I would all move back a little bit. Um, so, um, uh, the last book we'll be reading in the course uh, is Hamilton's Blessing, um, which is taken, I read the passage earlier in Cherno's book, Hamilton says, a moderate amount of public debt may be a blessing, and which is why John Steele Gordon took that phrase. And so, uh, the last thing we'll do in the course is to examine Hamilton's legacy and the question of the public debt, which, if you aren't aware of the fact, is now, anybody know what our public debt, the total amount of our public debt, is now looming at the brink of? Uh, a hundred trillion? About 30 trillion. Oh. Uh, well, you're only 70 trillion off. The trillion. All right, bless your heart. No, it's in the trillions. Um, so, uh, uh, Gordon's attempt, Gordon's book is an attempt to sort of see how Hamilton did, in fact, uh, save the United States from financial insolvency, and within one decade had turned the United States from one of the great debtor nations of the world into really one of the most financially solvent. And then, as you'll see, what, what Steele Gordon tries to do is to bring the issues of the debt and the deficit uh, somewhat forward in time and then to project it in the future, which I thought was a good way of sort of ending a class on Hamilton by raising the question of, what, did, what does Hamilton's relevance literally have to the country that you are about to inherit and whose debt you are about to inherit? So uh, what we'll do today is I want to, uh, if I, when I sort of laid out this part of Hamilton's life, uh, I divided the main parts of his participation. Again, and what is Act 3? His becoming Secretary of the Treasury and in effect, as, as Chernow argues, the real first Prime Minister of the United States. Not quite that that officer actually exists in our constitutional system, but he was in fact the guiding light and in some ways the primary organizer of Washington's cabinet and almost all of Washington's major policies. So I want to uh, look at, first of all, the creation of the executive branch and judicial branch and, and the stamp that Hamilton slash Washington left on the, on the executive branch. And then second, to tie in what, the movie we just watched, The Tale of Two Cities, into the, the, the great question, which is both a foreign policy question, which it entitled, it entailed the first great controversies in foreign policy in the Washington administration, but 
It also led to one of the first great con constitutional controversies under the Washington administration. I teach constitutional law, among other things, and of course the American presidency is one of the other courses that I teach. And this is, I guess what, the first, second, the, so not only is Hamilton uh, a major founder of the constitutional period, you'll see that his founding influence continues because the stamp that he live, leaves on this great constitu constitutional controversy of the proclamation of neutrality, more about that in a minute. And as you'll see, Hamilton's great uh, debating partner in that debate, the Pacificus Helvetius debate, was James Madison. So one of the stories that, uh, that Chernow tells, by the way, is how these two giants uh, and allies of constitutional framing, Madison and Hamilton, and who, in my opinion, after a lifelong study of this material, are the two greatest minds of the American founding, that dwarf the influence even of Thomas Jefferson and John Adams uh, and even Benjamin Franklin. Yet, uh, and, and what we've seen so far in the course is how they cooperated. Remember, these two young men uh, were elected to the Articles of Confederation Congress, and they served uh, from 1780 to 83. They became convinced of its infirmity. They participated in getting the Constitutional Convention launched. They were leading lights of the Constitutional Convention. And after the Constitution was proposed and set out for ratification, ratification during 1787 and 1788, they were the giants of constitutional interpretation and explanation in the magnificent Federalist Papers. But the moment, again, that they took office, these two giants of constitutional cooperation began to disagree, and by the time their public careers were over, were bitter, bitter enemies. And this was the first great confrontation between them publicly over the interpretation of the Constitution and, as you'll see, the interpretation of presidential power. And for you to understand that, I've given you a little quote from the Constitution, and I'll try to unfold. I was going to have you actually read the Pacificus, Pacificus Helvetius debates, but I decided, you poor, pauvre lapin, you poor, oh. you poor bunnies, you had already struggled so much under the burden of writing that I decided to talk about the Pacificus Helvetius papers rather than make you read them. Instead, I shall act them out in finger puppets. Madison. <laughs> Hamilton. Yeah, there we go. Then uh, uh, we'll, uh, we'll cover the other great acts of Hamiltonianism during this period. The assumption of the state and private debt and uh, under the Assumption Bill, which you remember from the, uh, uh, from the play was the dinner, the room where it happens. And, and Turner has a lovely description of that. The next issue we'll turn to under before is the, and which I've called, by the way, I've called this uh, the, um, the creation of, of modern finance, one and two and three, is, uh, is the creation of the National Bank. And it's under that issue, by the way, the creation of the National Bank, that I want to include the other great political development going on in America during the first decade, and that is the rise of political parties. And Chernow was very good on this, of how parties began to form, and primarily almost in the personal rivalry of Hamilton and Madison and Hamilton and Jefferson. Um, I don't have too much to say about the report of manufacturers except to direct your attention to it. And then we'll end this section with uh, a poignant comment that Chernow makes about the effect of leaving Hamilton, Hamilton, of Hamilton leaving Washington's cabinet. It wasn't just the end of a great partnership. Um, Washington could not have been Washington without Hamilton, and in the same way, Hamilton could not have been Hamilton without Washington. And as you'll see, well, let's just go right there. If you have your, your Chernow book, we'll just read this nice comment. What page is it? Hold on one second. I will direct you to the page. It's page 488. So read, Sammy, read. Run, Forrest, run. Where do I start? Uh, where I marked on the page. <laughs> on page 488. So this is, see this as a kind of a summary of Act 3 of Hamilton's life and the public prelude to Act 4. And if we have time today, under the private section, which if you look in the bottom of the second page of the notes, we'll get into perhaps, of course, the other thing in his private life that completely dominates and eventually determines his eventual public life. And that's, of course, his affair with Mariah Reynolds. So do you see on page 4088, 
after Alexander Hamilton. Okay, okay. So this is page 48, second paragraph. Okay. After Alexander Hamilton left the Treasury Department, he lost the strong restraining hand of George Washington and the invaluable sense of tact and proportion that went with it. First as aide de camp and then as Treasury Secretary, Hamilton had been forced, as Washington's representative, to take on some of his decorum. Now that he was no longer subordinate to Washington, Hamilton was even quicker to perceive threats, issue challenges, and take a high-handed tone in controversy. Some vital layer of imposition disappeared. Which is an interesting reflection on, on how certain people in your environment bring out certain aspects of your character. Um, and I have to say that of many of the aspects of Miranda's play that are really beautifully drawn, it's this mutual dependence of Washington on Hamilton and Hamilton on Washington. So I think this paragraph is the, is the fitting one to mark Act 3 of Hamilton's life and Act 4, which... Which for and remember, you've written two essays on on whether Hamilton was a tragic character, and and I think this passage is the key to the emergence of the tragic elements of his character. Once Washington's um, uh, restraining influence is taken away, the literally the more tragic elements: his pride, his his uh, his sensitivity to hurt, and his sense of personal importance, um, uh, uh, take over his character and and really determine the rest of his life. Let me ask you, uh, I may actually suggest this as an essay on the final. Again, remember, just to remind you, the final is at the end of the class. So December. Um, uh, it has two parts, the PRQs that you'll be uh, writing on, on this and the other books. But the essay question, the essay portion, I'll probably give out four to six comprehensive essays and allow you, uh, not allow you, but on the day of the exam, by chance, I'll flip coins, by the way, and they will not be... Uh, they won't be. I've taught a couple of classes with Professor McCoy, and we've used this method before, but she always writes the numbers of the essay questions that she wants to write on the other, so it's fixed. No, this will be real chance. So, but I'm actually thinking as a possible essay question, and, and just take a quick poll on this. How many of you think Hamilton would have made a good, let alone a great president? Why, Jamirian? Have you ever known anybody with good intentions that failed as a human being? I'm not saying that that would happen, but I agree with you, I had good intentions. And probably, again, as I've already suggested with Madison, was one of the, had the strongest grasp of the Constitution. But being an intellectual, even being a public intellectual with public power, such as the Secretary of State or Secretary of Treasury, is not the same as the presidency. I think actually, after years of studying the American presidency, the American presidency is a unique institution. It's radically dependent upon personal abilities in ways that even often the candidates for the presidency can't match. Sammy. I think he would have been a good president because he basically was the president when he was helping George Washington and he helped, him, he helped influence so many decisions. Unquestionably. And we'll see, by the way, the executive branch, as we conceive it, wouldn't be unimaginable without him. And the presidency as it has emerged over the last two centuries, would not be imaginable without Hamilton. Anybody else want to take a stab at that? How many think Hamilton wouldn't have made a good president? Do you have a thought, Joe? Would Hamilton have made a good president? That's Nicole Gillis uh, uh, nodding. Sarah, do you think that he would have made a good president? Well, um, I, I will say this. He certainly had intellect. He had passion, as you point out. He was devoted to uh, the republic. Uh, but on the other hand, he was not a compromiser. And that's what I wonder. Uh, I wonder if, and that's the whole passage that uh, Cherno reflects on. Aside from Hamilton, by the way, uh, maybe if, if I weren't retiring, maybe one of the next courses I would teach would be George Washington. 
because George Washington is also one of the most interesting persons at the founding. Here's an interesting thing about Washington that reflects in that paragraph that we just read. Washington, when he was growing up, was a sensitive, passionate, and impulsive individual. And he saw it in his life as leading, by the way, as a military commander to the first great military disaster under the French and Indian War. And so Washington undertook as a young man the project of completely remaking his character. And therefore, he imposed upon almost everything that he said and did and wrote a remarkable self-conscious discipline. Uh, I have to say that, that I don't think Washington was a great intellect, but from the standpoint of an individual who takes hold of his life and then determines at a young age that he will no longer be the victim of his passions, that he will master himself and, and not only create for himself this remarkably disciplined person, but that the sense that that's what the nation need. So the president, uh, the individual that eventually became the commander in chief and the president of the convention, the constitutional convention, and the president of the United States was the mo perhaps the most disciplined individual at the time of the founding, whose personal and public discipline probably were indispensable to the republic. It's under that umbrella that Hamilton reached his best. And I guess the, one, the reason I wonder if he'd make a good president, um, uh, or maybe this might even be a good question, why didn't Hamilton become president? Because he clearly, I think, wanted to and intended eventually to have his ambition lead him there, but it wasn't to be. I'm not sure that devoid of Washington's discipline that Hamilton could have functioned as the chief executive. I don't know that for sure, but that's something we're thinking about and that pulls together several things. Meanwhile, uh, let's see. I want to keep reading. Well, we'll get back to you. Ryan, um, um, I thought you might enjoy the last couple of lines of A Tale of, Su a tale of Two Cities. Um, and then I want to ask you a little bit about that and then we'll get back to our notes. Ryan, would you read one of the most remarkable? So what? this is the way that the book ends. It imagined, it almost as if, it's almost as if Carton, as he's ascending the steps of the guillotine, has a vision of what's to come. And, uh, and, and almost you, 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 uh, what Dickens is trying to do is to try to imagine, have you imagine what's going through the mind of this man as he steps up to his own death. Ryan, do you want to read? Sure. Yeah, just start. Uh -huh. One of the most remarkable sufferers by the same axe, a woman, had asked at the foot of the same scaffold not long before to be allowed to write down the thoughts that were inspiring her. If he had given any utterance to his, and they were prophetic, they would have been these. I see Barstad and Clyde the Barge. The vengeance. You know who the vengeance was? She was that old woman that was uh, Madame Defarge's confidant, the one who cackled through the whole thing. <laughs> That was the vengeance. Um, the jurymen, the judge, long ranks of the new oppressors who have risen on the destruction of old, perishing by this retributive instrument. What's the, re what's the retributive instrument he's referring to? Guillotine. The guillotine. The instrument of revolutionary purification. Go ahead. Before it shall cease out of its present use. I see a beautiful city and a brilliant people rising from this abyss, and in their struggle to be truly free, and their triumphant defeat, through long, long to come, I see the people of this time, and the previous and of the previous time of which this is the natural birth, gradually making ex expiation for itself and wearing out. So by the way, um, Dickens wrote uh, Dickens wrote most of his novels in the eighteen twenties and thirties. So he had already lived to see uh, uh, the fall of the – by the way, by the time that we talk about the foreign policy reverence in the Washington administration, uh, the revolutionary administration had already, by its own designation, been called the terror. So what does is, what is Dickens see uh, Carton as the outcome of the horror that engulfs him and his personal uh, life? And by the way, where do you think Dickens stands on, on this? I, I think this is reflected in the movie, by the way. Where, where was Dickinson's sympathy, Dickens' sympathies? Well, clearly with Sidney. 
How many think you could have done what Sidney Carton did? Oh, I had film. <laughs> How many you would have done what Sidney Carton did? Well, we'll see. He. <laughs> Good for you. Um, do you think he sympathized with the old Bourbon regime, the the monarchy? If you've read the book and in the movie, I, I think the scenes of sympathy with the peasants and their starvation and their suffering, I think it's too vivid to think that he simply sympathizes with that. Yet clearly, what is he aghast by? Do you think he approves of the trial of of the of the? Do you remember number twenty two, the little uh, seamstress? Uh, or do you, or uh, or do you think he approves of? Do you do you think Dickens thinks that Sidney Carton, that, excuse me, that Charles Darnay was dealt justly? Because like that was not even like um, the reality of reality. Yeah. And Isn't everything that Dr. Manette and, for that matter, Citizen Gabel, you remember his tutor? Isn't everything that they said about Darnay true? Well, didn't Darnay denounce his title? Yes, he renounced his title and denounced his uncle. Uh, so in some ways, and this is why I think, remember I asked you to think about the fact not only there are two cities here, prim primarily London and Paris, but perhaps the old Paris versus the new Paris, but... You also see two trials in this narrative. What are the two trials? Now, do you remember, by the way, uh, uh, would, you have, would you have said the trial in London was the perfection of, of due process? After all, what was almost the outcome of that trial? Yeah. And you, uh, remember, I mean, uh, uh, I didn't have to tell you because it turns out that I think either Barzad or Cly, I can't remember which of them actually, is pretty graphic about the... the and remember, uh, England did not abolish that punishment till the 1820s, I think. So that meant up until the 1820s, England, which was a so-called so -called civilized country, you could be hanged, drawn, and quartered. How many of you ever saw... What's that movie with Mel Gibson about the blue-faced Scottish rebel? Braveheart, yeah. thank you. Now you know what it's like to be trapped in the mind and body of, a, of an overweight 69-year-old man. Um, Braveheart. Do you remember the ending of Braveheart? Do you watch Braveheart? Uh, I think so. It's been a long time. How many of you saw Braveheart? No. They oh, acted no. out. They, oh. they acted out. He, he's hanged, drawn, and quartered at the end. And they acted out by a clown pantomime. Uh, so he's hanged almost to the point of death. Then he's taken down. His intestines are split open and pulled out. And I remember in Braveheart, there's a clown acting it out by pulling a rope out of a dummy. And then he's attached to four horses. That was the punishment in England. So, so would you have to say England was itself a necessarily a utopian society? But what was the difference between the trial in London and the trial in Paris? Dickens doesn't, leave, uh, doesn't miss this point. First of all, there is a jury, right? And and what actually happened? And you remember the stuffy old judge with the wig, uh, blowing the powder, the the snuff, and everything. And he seems kind of kind of a fuddy duddy. But actually, he actually does make sure what, huh? Yeah, because what actually happens during the course of the trial? What's supposed to happen in a trial? Witnesses speak. I mean, after all, a trial is an accusation, isn't it? What's supposed to happen in a trial if it's a good trial? If it's a just trial? So, by the way, in a criminal trial, there are only two possibilities. What are the two possibilities? Guilty or, or not guilty, innocent. And isn't the critical thing about procedure in a trial to try to discern who's guilty and innocent? So what's the outcome of that trial? Yeah. Well, of course, it's because Carton revealed uh, 
uh, Barzad to be, a, let's just say, a corruptible witness, although he doesn't get him in trouble. But the point is, an innocent man is declared innocent and gets off, right? What happens in the in the Paris trial? So in some ways, Dickens's point, and I think this is true, in the revolutionary fury of the of the tribunal of the of the of revolutionary court, is even the question of guilt and innocent of interest to the court. It's really a, it's a, it's an instrument of revolutionary vengeance more than anything else. In which, by the way, I'm struck. You know, I'm an Orthodox Jew, and and we read through the entire five books of Moses every year. Right now, we're right at the beginning of Genesis, or in the middle point of Genesis. And how many of you know the story of Sodom and Gomorrah? Sodom and Gomorrah. I don't think I knew it. I remember it. You've never heard of Sodom and Gomorrah? Sodom and Gomorrah? Well, wasn't it where like they were like taken out of the city and like blood came back, but the dead she like that was the deal? Yes, that's fair. No. Why was Sodom and Gomorrah destroyed? Why were those two cities? All right. This wasn't Bible stories, but I can't believe you don't know this. You've never heard this story before? I remember. I I was not Christian. All right. Well, bless your heart. I try to imagine that one. Um, Yeah, it was really hard. It was bad. But wasn't it they were living in a corrupt city? Yes. Um, Worse than Spartanburg. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, So uh, here's the story, and you'll see why I'm mentioning this in a minute. Um, uh, It's chapter 16 of Genesis. Three angels come to Abraham, and Abraham makes dinner for them. And while and they've come, by the way, to predict that Abraham, in who's 99, and Sarah, who's 75, are going to have the son Isaac. And by the way, she laughs she, when she hears this prediction. Sarah laughs, and, and the angels say, why are you laughing? And she says, I wasn't laughing. He says, you were laughing, and because she's 75 years old, and Abraham is 99. And it turns out that Isaac, the word Isaac means he will laugh in Hebrew, because his birth was miraculous. But then the angel says, this is what I'm planning to do to Sodom and Gomorrah. Their corruption has reached the heavens. I'm going to destroy it. And Abraham's cousin Lot lives there with his family. So two of the angels then head off, come to Sodom, Sodom, and they get through the gate, they come to Lot's house, but then everyone in all the people in Lot, uh, in, in Sodom, come to Lot's house. They try to break down the door. They want to rape the two angels. And and uh, and Lot, being a good father, says, here, take my daughters instead. Um, but the angels strike everybody with blindness. And the angels say, you get you and your family and everything and get out of here. Tomorrow, destruction is raining down and don't look back. And that's where your memory comes in. So the next morning, Lot gets his whole family, his daughters and everything. They leave town. And just as they're leaving, Lot's wife looks back as Saddam is destroyed by volcanic eruption or something like that, or raining sulfur from the sky. Uh, and um, uh, and then she turns into a pillar of salt. And it has an even uh, stranger ending because Lot's two daughters think they're the only people left in the world, so they engage their father, and they get him drunk, and they have sex, and they are the father of two nations. All right, good. The reason I mentioned this whole thing... Uh, so that's the part they never read out loud um, or you, that you get to talk about in Bible school. So here's the point. Before the two angels go to Sodom and Gomorrah, Abraham says to God, what if there are 50 righteous people in the city? Will you destroy it for their sake? And God says, if there are 50 righteous people, I will not destroy it. Then Abraham clearly tries to bargain God down. He says, what if there are 45 righteous people? And God says, I won't destroy it for the sake of 45 innocent people. And then Abraham keeps pressing him. And he says, he says, what if there are 40 righteous people, 30 righteous people? And then God says to Abraham, will not the judge of all the ju- earth judge justly? Far be it from you to sweep away the innocent with the guilty. So, by the way, here's the end of the story. Abraham gets him down to 20 uh, and then to 10. And then, Abra- and then God just leaves off. So in other words, it turns out there aren't even 10 righteous people. So Sodom gets destroyed. The point I wanted you to see is, how does Abraham go hold God accountable? He says, shall not the judge of all the earth judge justly? And what's the essence of justice? What's the essence of injustice? Treating the innocent like the guilty. So isn't the very essence of justice separating between guilty and innocent? 
And yet, what's the very nature of the Revolutionary Tribunal? They are completely indifferent to that. I mean, after all, that's why that tender story of the seamstress is put in there. What did that young woman do? She happened to be a friend or work for somebody that worked for an aristocrat, and she gets swept away in the revolutionary violence. So, uh, let's see. Um, uh, Brian, would you like to read? Sure. So this is what's going then um, uh, through Carton's mind as he, pass as he steps up to the guillotine. I see the line in which I lay down my life, hateful and useful, prosperous and happy, and I end in which I shall see no more. I see her with a child upon her bosom who bears my name. I see her father, aged and dead, but otherwise restored, and faithful to all her through the office and at peace. I see the good old man, no longer a friend, who ten years time has written him with all he had of compassion and joy. Go ahead. that I hold a sanctuary in their hearts and in the hearts of their descendants and generations hence. I see her, an old woman, weeping not to be loved today. I see her and her husband, their four sons, lying side by side in their last Christmas bed. And I know that each was not more honored and most sacred in his soul than I was in the soul of the dead. Go ahead. I see that I see that child who lay upon her bosom and I bore my name. A man winning his way up that path of life more to above. I see his lineage so well that my name is meant to be illustrious there by the light of day. I see the blot that he was on faded away. I see him for most of just serving and honored men bringing a boy of my name for her that I know a golden hair to this place then fair to look upon. Not a trace of his days is hidden in and I hear them I hear them tell the child no story, but the tender and false man hope. And last. It is a far, far better thing than that I do, that I have ever done. It is a far, far better work that I have held to the manifest. You let him read so much, I'm worried. Good for you. But that is, of course, uh, in addition to the opening of this book, it was the best of times and worst times. That last line is also one of the most prominent let, uh, 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 passages in uh, English literature. So, what did you think? What did you think of the movie? Did you enjoy it? It was sad. The man that ended up, that ended up. Joe, you seem indifferent. I thought it was just a fun. I, I, I went into it with low expectations. So, uh, <laughs> not, not, to say that, not to say that I thought it was going to be bad. It's just I didn't really have any expectations. So, Did you know the story? Uh, not really. Anybody know the story before? You did, Nicole, right? Um, did you know the story? Had you read the story in French? I'm just curious. Um, all right. Now, the reason I thought it was useful in this um, in this class was to portray the background of, as I already said before, the first great foreign policy crisis of the Washington administration. But as you're going to see, we'll read some passages from Chernow. This wasn't just a foreign policy crisis. It was both a foreign policy crisis in terms of how we designate foreign policy but it was also a constitutional crisis, as you will see, and it was also a domestic crisis, threatening the very stability and existence of the nation. So uh, if you're looking at the notes, uh, let's, uh, let's first go through the first, uh, at, the first scene, so to speak, of Hamilton's life as Secretary of Treasury, and that was the creation of the executive and judicial branch. Uh, Chernow has an interesting comment. He says... Um, I think I think um, Washington, who's you know his mansion was on Mount Vernon. Have you been to Mount Vernon before? It's, it's actually a nice place to visit. It overlooks the Potomac. It's down the river from Washington. Washington probably had at the peak about two hundred slaves servants at Mount Vernon. And Chernow points out that when he left Mount Vernon to come to New York to become president of the United States, um, he, he had far more uh, subordinates at Mount Vernon than he did as president of the United States. And one of the things that the first Congress did after the Constitution went into effect on March 4th, 1789, of course, the legislative branch was constituted. They'd been elected in the first elections. Washington and John Adams had been elected by the first electoral college. But in essence, the other two branches of government didn't exist at all. Those in the Constitution, if you read the Constitution, it's the role of Congress through legislation to actually create 
the executive branch, and the judicial branches. Uh, and, and let's talk about the judicial branch for a second. Um, uh, in some ways, following Hamilton's blueprint in the Fiddles papers on the, seven, the 70s papers that you read, you read in 78 on judicial review and the independence of the judiciary, the Congress and the Judiciary Act of 1789, which, by the way, is still the foundational act for our judiciary. Um, over the centuries, the number of laws of the United States have grown massively, and the U.S. Code is the formal composi uh, composition, or, or, uh, yeah, composition of all the laws of the United States. But that first law, the Judiciary Act of 1789, that set up the district courts and then the circuit courts and then the Supreme Court, um, is still the foundational at, uh, law that establishes our judiciary and the one that the judicial branch goes by. It established a Supreme Court of, essential, of five members. And for your information, this has become controversial in the last year. There, the Constitution doesn't fix the number of Supreme Court justices. It went from five to seven during the Civil War. It was up till nine. It went up to 11 uh, right after the Civil War. And right after the Civil War, it's stuck by custom around nine. If you follow the news, you know why that number has been controversial, because uh, uh, President Trump got to appoint three uh, members to the judiciary, and, and in some ways, uh, many people opposed that and wanted to uh, 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 raise the number of judges so that President Biden would have more judges to appoint, etc. But my guess is this crisis is going to pass and will probably keep the number at nine. The other thing they did, of course, was to create the executive branch. They created five executive departments, state, treasury, justice, interior, and I just blanked on the fifth one. Stop that chortling. Um, and of course, Hamilton was appointed uh, head of treasury. Treasury was the largest department, as Chernow reports. I think he had 50, so of all the departments, I think Jefferson had as secretary of state five members of the state department at that point. And I think uh, Hamilton had it 57. And there's no question it was the busiest of the departments. Um, so uh, look in the Chernow book for how he creates the Treasury Department. There are two other instances from this period that I wanted to draw to your attention. He's also the founder of the Coast Guard because smuggling was a major source of uh, income for individuals. And so the creation of the Coast Guard was part of his plan, not only to get smuggling under control, but as you're going to see, to create a stable source of revenue. You remember that under the Articles of Confederation, the national government had no power to raise revenue. So uh, this, by the way, leaks into the third thing I want to talk about, which is the assumption of the debt and the creation of the bank. Obviously, one of the things the Constitution granted to the new nation was the power to raise revenue. And at that point, anybody know what the major source of revenue of the United States is today? Where does the U.S. government get most of its money? What kind? There are actually three primary kinds of taxation you can have. Uh, and, and for the first 150 years of our life, the first two were the source of the United States government's revenue. Um, anybody? Income taxes. Um, I don't want to go fully into this. This is an interesting constitutional question. But Article 1, Section 2 of the Constitution says representatives and direct taxes shall be apportioned according to the population in each state. So in the 1880s and 90s, when the federal government first tried to put income taxes into effect, it was declared unconstitutional because a direct tax, which the court has interpreted as a tax that lands on individuals, had to be apportioned according to states. So the 16th Amendment to the Constitution declared income taxes not to be direct taxes, and that's why the vast bulk of the the government's revenue comes from income taxes. But the other two primary kinds of taxes are excise taxes, we'll come back to that in a minute, and import taxes. What are import taxes? Taxes on imported goods. And that's why the formation of the Coast Guard was so critical. So Hamilton could get the smuggling under it so that literally you could also turn to imports as a source of uh, uh, import taxes. What's an excise tax? What is, what is an incision? What's when you incise something? What's an incision? I don't know anything about it except for the There and that's exactly how most people know it. What's an incision? Yeah. The the Latin word is kisere, kitere, which means to cut. So what's an incision? To cut something? To 
cut something to cut into something. Like I just had knee surgery a couple of weeks ago when I tore my meniscus and they made an incision and cut part of it out. Um, um, which is why I'll never resume my ballet career again. I know. Yeah, I wanted to see you in form like so bad. I know. It's, uh, you're just going to have to imagine it. Actually, when I was first full-time teaching in 1981, 82 at Dickinson College, uh, I have the habit of breaking into singing spontaneously just like Benjamin Franklin did in 1776. And I was singing in the post office at Dickinson College, and uh, the head of their uh, theater department was in the mail room at the same time, and it turns out their lead for Damn Yankees, Damn Yankees is a musical comedy where an old fan of the Washington Senators sells his soul to the devil yeah, to become young again to play for the, against the Yankees. And so he heard me singing, and their, their lead had just quit, so he said, the play was in three weeks, so he said, will you step in and be our lead? So he said, I'll do it. Is there video evidence of this? Yes, there is. Well, then you show And that. so, by the way, I was, in, I, was, I was in that play. And I have to say, uh, I played baseball in high school, but I, I don't know a damn thing about baseball. And I had to sing a baseball song, which was like singing opera in another language. Strike three, ball four, walk a run, I'll tie the score. You're blind, dump, you're blind, dump. You must be out of your mind, dump. All right. Um, so I know that was exciting, wasn't it? It was like an incision. Um, so it turns out I took a tap class for in, during the spring semester, and I learned how to pre-professionally tap. So I could, used to be a tap dancer, for that matter. There. But that's all behind me now. So what's an excision? What is an excision? The tax of a cow? Correct. An excise tax is a tax on a produced or consumed good. How many of you smoke cigarettes? <laughs> only that, only that. <laughs> and you smoke cigarettes still? How many of you pay groceries? Uh, I think in South Carolina there's a 6% tax on groceries. In Tennessee it's 9.75. Okay, that is an excise tax. It's terrible. Because it's a tax on either a good produced or consumed. Why is that important? Pardon me? Yeah, that's why I know that too. Well, you, can, so you can overcome almost anything in life. Um, so anyway, so the, one of the first controversial proposals that Alexander propo Hamilton proposed as uh, Secretary of the Treasury was an excise tax on whiskey. Now, the reason I'm mentioning this is this is one of the first great tests of the Washington administration and one that set the president, the precedent, I should say this. You wrote an essay on Federal 70, 71, and 70. Two, and what did Hamilton think the most important quality in the executive was? Do you remember? Energy. Energy, firmness, the capacity to act with decisive action and swiftness. And so, why was whiskey the commodity that he picked uh, to choose? Pardon me? It was, and why? They do, especially at faculty meetings. Um, yeah. Yes. It turns out that for corn and grain, converting corn and grain into whiskey was one major way of preserving it so it could become a saleable quality. And in many of the up counties, uh, in, in the rural counties, all the way up the, down the Appalachian Mountains, and especially in the western counties of Pennsylvania, corn and grain growing was a major source of income and whiskey production. So obviously Hamilton knew the drinking habits of Americans, and he also knew that this was a commodity uh, which would produce a lot of revenue. Except, what had the revolution been fought in, fought against? Taxation. Right, no taxation without representation, right? Now, of course, the difference was Congress was elected by the people, and that's what Hamilton argued. So you have to understand, somebody's got to pay for something. Somebody's got to pay for it. So in some ways, this tax was the first great test of the internal administration of the Washington administration. And so um, actually, I'm going to come back to this in a minute. Do you see down on the bottom of the page? I actually quote from you from Article 2, Section 2, which is the listing of the president's powers. Um, so, uh, uh, Joe, do you have your thing in front of you? Uh, I put it away, but oh, I bless your heart. Can, no, no, Jamirian. Would you read Article 2, Section 2? So Article 2, Section 1 creates the presidency. Article 2, Section 2 and 3 give the president's powers. So read Article 2, Section 2, Clause 1. All right. The president shall make 
And by the way, you all understand that power. That's the commander-in-chief power. Go ahead. Now, by the way, I want you to know that when Hamilton discusses this in the Federalist Papers, this particular power of, of acquiring the opinion and writing of his subordinates, he says, this almost is a superfluity, almost doesn't need to be mentioned, because if you're an administrator over subordinates, you already have the power to ask for their opinion and writing. But why add this? Because it confirmed the president's power over the executive branch and administrators. Go ahead. So three powers there, commander-in-chief, uh, chief administrator, and chief partner, uh, which, a power which has also been very controversial. Uh, clause two, go ahead. And this is relevant, as you're going to see, not only for what we're talking about, but also um, uh, uh, what we're going to come up against in a minute. So let's stop. This is called the treaty-making power. So the president has the power to make treaties, but not independently. It's shared with the Senate. And when that power is shared with the Senate, what kind of majority is necessary for a, trend, for a treaty to be passed? Two thirds. Two thirds of the Senate have to agree to a treaty. Now, hold on to this. I'll just mention it. We'll come back to it on Friday then when we resume this discussion. That's how you make a treaty. What doesn't it say anything about? Well, you could say this once a treaty is passed, what's the president's job once it's passed? Sign. To sign it and to enforce it, right? Like a law. Mm -hmm. What does it? I'm actually loading the question. It tells you how to make a treaty. What doesn't it tell you here in this clause? What's not described in the clause? How you unmake a treaty. How you repeal a treaty. And you're going to see the Constitution's silence on that question is what leads to the great contest between Madison and Hamilton on the nature of the president's powers and the proclamation of neutrality. Now, the only reason I wanted to say this, if you go on, it says he shall take care that the laws be faithfully executed. In other words, what's the president's job? To execute the laws, right? And I'll just finish with this. After the, so what became uh, known as the Whiskey Rebellion, what about 6,000 uh, armed uh, rebels in the up, count, up counties of Pennsylvania, Western Pennsylvania, they marched to prevent the collection of the tax. Washington, at the head of the troops, about 7,000 troops, 12,000 troops actually, with Hamilton as his guard, marched into Pennsylvania and put down the rebellion. This was the first real assertion of executive power under the Constitution. It's called the Whiskey Rebellion. And what does it exist as Constitution? You see the power of commander-in-chief as one power, right? And then later on, you get the power to exact your laws. Are those different powers, or are they, are they combinable? And who made that argument? Hamilton. That the president could use armed force to enforce federal law. And as you're going to see... That set the precedent for, if you will, the vigorous use of executive power to enforce federal laws that uh, exist to this very day. We'll see you on Friday. I will post this. Uh, for those of you that want to relive this wonderful moment again and again, I will post the link for this video. Don't trip.